So plants. It's going to be relatively superficial, and it's going to feel like I'm throwing a lot of words at you. The point isn't to memorize all the words, just so you know. And this is not on your test for Tuesday. This will be on a test some other Tuesday. Objectives. Objectives. Yay. So now let's use some terms. So this course is ecology and physiology. We are officially done with ecology. Except I'm going to keep dragging it up for the rest of the semester. Because if you're a living thing, you cannot escape ecology. It will always come back and haunt you. So just because we're officially done doesn't mean it goes away. So the other part, physiology. It's the way in which we maintain homeostasis. The way we keep staying alive. The term homeostasis is a weird one because the word itself literally means stay the same. So if I were to make a graph of time, that's an awful, there we go, time and something important. The way we think of the term homeostasis is it's like a dashed line, and this is what we need to be. You need to be on that dashed line, and if you're not, you're dead. Catches it's not true. We don't stay the same. What we do instead is we maintain something referred to as a dynamic equilibrium. What we mean by that is it's not the dashed line. It's a zone around the dashed line. And as long as you stay in this area, you're okay. If you look at this and you were to average it out, it's the dashed line. But you have some give and take. The dynamic equilibrium is stay within the, the zone. And if you do that, you're good. Living things maintain a dynamic equilibrium for all sorts of processes. Some things, our, our equilibrium, our range is really small. We have very little intolerance to change. But some, we can handle really big changes. It kind of just depends on the something important. We've seen this picture before. What is it? It's carrying capacity. Population. The carrying capacity is the homeostasis. What happens to a population? It fluctuates around it the dynamic equilibrium. When we deal with us, living things, what we have to worry about is the form of the living thing and the function of the living thing. And the thing with these two words is they're related, obviously. Form tells you something about what it's going to do. If I have a structure that is round, and it has like a pivot on it. That means it probably can roll. If I have something that's pokey to a sharp end, and it's on a living thing, that's probably telling you it's some type of protective structure. If you have something that happens to be colorful, the color is probably telling you something about what it's going to do. How it is built, the form, tells you something about what it's going to do. Form implies the function. But similarly, if you know what you want something to do, only a handful of solutions pop into your head. If you want to have an organism that is capable of flight, a handful of things need to show up. It needs to be lightweight. And you probably need some type of huge surface area with some flaps to show up. Lightweight, big flaps. The function, 
go airborne requires a certain set of structures that you can't really violate. How something is built tells you something about what it's going to do. And if you know what you are wanting something to do, that tells you how it's probably going to be built. So you know what you could potentially look for. If I look at you, a living thing, what are you made out of? Cells. This is your form. Well, what's the thing that tells us how you're going to function? It's your cells. Because we talk about what your heart cells are doing. We can talk about what your neurons, your brain cells are doing. We can talk about what your you know, rods and cones, so eyeball cells, what they are doing. What tells us how to function? They're also your cells. The point being, the anatomy deals with cells. The physiology deals with cells. And they're the same thing. When we look at how something is built, we're going to look at the exact same thing about that's going to tell us how it works. They are inseparable. If you talk one, you must talk the other. And in particular, because we need a little bit more PTSD, it's not just the cells that we care about. It's something about the cells that we care about. And that would be proteins. Ochem. Ochem is going to tell us how we're built. And Ochem is going to tell us how we work. I know, you're all like, I quit! Peace. Actually, you're not even saying peace. Other four-letter word. Even though peace doesn't have four letters. Whatever. We're not going to do Ochem. We're just going to deal with organic chemistry. Meaning biological molecules, not SN1, SN2s, alkylation, let's remove, a, or let's do a Grignard reaction, none of that. That's, oh, I couldn't tell you how to do one of those. Doesn't the Grignard reaction have like an MG or something like that in it? I think it like adds like, what, like chlorines or bromines or something like that, and then you can like desubstitute. A lot of them do that, so. It's all make-believe. It really is. I mean, they tell you, yes, this is the reaction. You're like, no, no, I, I, I think you're making this stuff up. Anywho. I don't know what's going on. So, the terms anatomy and physiology, we have to tie together. If any, have any of you ever taken an anatomy class? Like just a strict human anatomy class or something like that? It's just memorize a bunch of words and point out where it is. A real physiology textbook, or not physiology, anatomy textbook is nothing but pictures. And the pictures just have labels. That, that's all it is. Yeah, it just memorize the picture. And then you have the picture in front of you, so a real life thing. Match the things that are in the picture. That, that's all it is. And the words are awful. And they don't make sense. And they're always long. And you're pretty sure they're not in English because they're not. It's awful. Sometimes Greek, sometimes French, sometimes Arabic. It can be all over the place. Have any of you taken a physiology class? <laughs> physiology class, do we use big words? Not really. But there seems to be a lot of pictures. And like, let's make a, di let's diagram out how this works. Meaning it's a series of pictures. Well, in old-fashioned speak, a series of pictures is called a movie. Physiology is movies. Anatomy is a picture that's labeled. The catch is, 
to understand anatomy, they usually have to tell you what the parts are doing because it somewhat kind of ties together. If you have a muscle that's called the sternocleidomastoid, it's telling you about where it turns out to be located. But if you have one called, mm, I'm trying to think. The adductor brevis. Ooh, I pulled one out that you're all like, what's an adductor brevis? Its location is on your thigh, but its job is to bring your thighs into the middle. Yes, because adduction means to come together, as opposed to abduction, which is when you're taken away. So what it does is important to understanding its name. To understand the anatomy, it helps if you know the physiology, its function. So if you learn anatomy, you have to learn some physiology. And when you take physiology, the words don't make sense if we can't reference back to a structure. So we have to drag the anatomy back on in to make the physiology make sense. If we talk plant physiology, because this is ecology and physiology, not ecology and anatomy, the only way the physiology makes sense to us is if we drag in some anatomy. And that's true for plants and for the animals. So we have to look at both. Otherwise, None of it's going to make sense. So we should talk some plant anatomy. And aside, let's talk 175. Plants. There's a lots of types of plants. Group number one, let's call them the non-vascular plants. These are all small. They might be, at best, an inch, inch and a half in length, if you're lucky. So things like the mosses, hornworts, liverworts. Could you find these on campus right now? Sure. Go between the admin building, and if you go over to the student center, you look in that nice little like walkway in between the two with all the stones. Covered in mosses right now absolutely covered in them if you wanted to ever name a species because you know you want to name things study non-vascular plants because anywhere you go where they grow odds are you might be the first person to ever really think about studying it so if you study these types of plants you'll probably discover several dozen species and if you discover it you get to name it. You, know, you usually, so you know, don't name it after people who are alive. Just because you don't want it to name it after someone and then discover, like, oops, a year later. Oh, let me tell you what horrible thing that person has done. So once the name is stuck, you kind of, it stays. So you kind of want to wait till, like, the person's dead and all the issues have fleshed out. Just saying. They're fascinating plants. We're not going to talk about them in any way, shape, or form. Moving on. We have the seedless vascular plants. The ones that you definitely know would be ferns. We have several around the building. Amazing plants. Only thing we're going to talk about is the fact that they're vascular. For the most part, uh, that's it. That's, that's all we really care about with them. So we're going to like brush by and go, hi, and then run away. Then we have the seed-making plants. Yeah, here's where we're going to spend our time. And even then, we're going to be biased. We're going to be biased towards the angiosperms. Wait. So, gymnosperms make seeds? Of course. But wh where are the seeds? They're hidden inside the cone. Why can't I see them? 
because they're small. Seeds turn out to be small. Why do we associate seeds with angiosperms and not with gymnosperms? Because the angiosperms come with... It's the word angio. Angio is something fleshy. Like fruit. Angiosperms produce fruit. Gymnosperms don't. Well, not the same type of fruit. This fruit is derived from flowers. So it's usually why we call these the flowering plants. How many groups of flowering plants are there? We did broad divisions. We have words like eudicot or the dicots. Then we also have the monocots. Is that it? We have what are, so technically there's two other groups. We have what we call the basal monoc or the basal angiosperms. And then we have the magnolias. Magnolia plants are not dicots and they're not monocots. They're their own branch. But basil, what the hell is a basil? They're the simple ones. Like the duckweed you're growing. It's a different group. It's not a monocot, it's not a dicot. It's its own little category. You've known about them since 174. No one ever told you, oh yeah, they're not like the other plants. Even though you look at them, you're like, these little freaky things. When we look at plant anatomy, we have to think about the term emergent property. So emergent properties are when the sum is greater than the parts, meaning I put a whole bunch of stuff together and it makes something more. You get more out of it than the individual pieces are capable of doing. What do I mean by that? If I were to take a bunch of fat, water, salt, sugars, proteins, and nucleic acids, and I have those all in test tubes, they don't, like they're just sitting there. If I mix them all together into a bigger test tube, they don't do anything. But if I arrange them in particular patterns, I create a cell. And the cell can do something that those, in, those molecules individually are incapable of doing. What's the thing it can do? It's alive. Those molecules by themselves are not alive. But if you get them in the right arrangement, life exists. If I take cells and get a combination of different types of cells, and I put them into a very specific pattern, I can create a tissue. The tissue can do things an individual cell is incapable of doing. Meaning tissues give you more than their cells are capable of doing. It's the combination that's important, which is the emergent property. You get new things that manifest as a result of piling them together. We do the same thing. If we take tissues, we can pile those together in a particular pattern. We can make an organ. Take these organs, pile them together in a particular pattern, and you can make the organism. So if we're going to talk plants, we should probably talk plant cells, tissues, organs, so that we can deal with the organism itself. Okay. Basic plant organs are going to be the roots, the shoots, and the leaves. All plants, if it's vascular, roots, shoots, leaves. At some point in those angiosperm plants' life cycle, we will add flowers. But this is at a specific time point. They are a bonus feature. They are not the main event.
So if I look at just, you know, the generic plant, the generic plant that no plant looks like. There is no plant that looks like this, but we're going to pretend like it does. Roots we associate as being structures underground. That is not necessarily true, but we're going to run with it for right now. What do they do? These are going to absorb nutrients from soil. I can buy that. The shoots. Stems and branches. These are going to be there so we can have growth. We can have structure. Ultimately, they're going to start forming these things that we'll call the leaves. The leaves, of course, are famous for food production. And at some point in this plant's life cycle, it's going to produce a modified version of a shoot that we call an inflorescence. And this is what's going to give rise to flowers. They are a different style of tissue than the rest of the plant, or a different type of organ. So you have to be careful if you were testing stuff off of the leaves that you see associated with flowers, they will be different than the normal, than the normal leaves that you see everywhere else. It's a different quality of existence. So that's it. No. Let's look at variants of all of these. So going for the roots. Easiest thing we can talk about with roots is the two major categories of these. Tap roots versus fibrous roots. Tap root, exactly what it sounds like. It's a root that's tapped into the ground. You can think of carrots. How difficult is it to pull a carrot out of the ground? Not overly difficult. You can do it. It's not as easy as it looks in like a cartoon, but you can take them out. They'll be fine. This is in contrast with a fibrous root, which actually do have a tap root, but they turn out to have a whole bunch of other roots that kind of spread out all over the place. If you try and take one of these out of the ground, how are you going to do? You're not. Plants that have fibrous roots, not all of them, but a good chunk of them, we give them a name. And it starts with a W. We call these weeds. Have any of you ever gone weeding? Enjoyable, easy. Your back is like, oh, this is so lovely. Your shoulders feel great the entire time. You don't have to worry about your hands getting stabbed by anything. You're like, oh, this is lovely. Why are they so difficult to pull out of the ground? Physics. All of those roots have surface area. And as they hold still, surface area exhibits static friction. Oh no. 
Oh no. Damn it. Why did the physics? Because we exist and we're based on physics. Sorry. So, if you look at this surface area versus this surface area, there's a lot less with the taproot, which means it's easier to overcome the static friction and you can it out. We have so much more surface area with the fibrous root that it becomes a lot more difficult to overcome the static friction. And the result is you're going to snap the stalk off before you get the roots out. And that's because of a physics game. There's a pattern that exists in biology that form equals function. The form is high surface area. The function could be in part, we can get lots of nutrients out of the ground. What could be another use of it? You can't get ripped out of the ground. It's a way of ensuring you stay in the ground and you can't get yanked out. High surface area could be related to, you can't get rid of it. They are harder to destroy, which would be its function. How it's built gives you a clue as to what it does. But we have other types of roots too. So we could have things like a prop root. They're just there as stilts hold you up. We got that. That's easy. We could have storage roots meaning we're going to put stuff into it. What would we put into it? Sugar. Oh, so these are just full of sugar? Well, actually, no. It's the plant storage version of sugar. You call it starch. But if you break down starch, it's nothing but glucose. And you know what this is? That's a sugar beet. Sugar beet. Where do you get your sugar from? Sugar cane, duh! No, you don't. No one gets it from sugar cane. Unless you live in the Caribbean, you don't get sugar from sugar cane. Sugar cane's a pain to make. You have to worry about the spiders with it. And it's difficult to process. What's easier to grow? Sugar beets. Because all I have to then do is yank them out of the ground. Because if you look at it, it's a, a taproot. Easy to yank them out. I can then just grind them up, take the liquid out, add some enzymes to break apart the starch. Is it difficult to get that enzyme? It's in your spit right now. So no, it's not particularly difficult. Amylase. So amylase, just for the sake of the side. Amylase is the enzyme that acts on amylose. What is amylose? Starch. That is the real name of starch. It's amylose. That's the real name. So if you want to sound smart, you don't make a starch slurry. You make an amylose slurry. You don't eat potatoes because you love the starchiness. You eat potatoes because you say, oh, the amylose is so good, especially when fried up and you add salt to it. Yeah. And the, the horrible thing is, some of you are going to like, Think that the next time you see French fries. You're going to think amylose. And congratulations, you're nerds too. Yeah. It, it ru <laughs> Science ruins everything. Like, I'm that person, you, I can't watch a movie with you. Because I'm the, no, no, that's not, no, that's not, that's not how that works. I know, I know. Yeah, because like, that doesn't make sense. 
Although I do like, although I still have an issue with it, the Neil deGrasse Tyson approach, which is he allows you, you're allowed one bit of supernatural. You're allowed one bit. But everything needs to make sense off of that one bit. So he has issues with things like Superman. Because you need so many things that it doesn't, Superman doesn't make sense. So he absorbs sunlight, then he can turn it into beams from his eyes, but he also can control his density, which allows him to fly. But wait, that has nothing to do with, with like the sunlight. And wait, what? And why is it this type of star instead of the other type of star? Because they give off the exact same type of radiation. So it's a, it all breaks down. You know the original Superman couldn't fly? Yes, it's always why he could leap over buildings. He didn't fly. He could just jump. He was strong enough to jump really high. Anyways. Metaphors. Pneumo, or means lung. So these are roots meant for breathing. Why would you need to have roots that can breathe? Because roots are alive. They need oxygen too. It's why when you have your plants and you don't drain them and you just keep dumping water in, you're like, let the plant die. Because you smothered it. It drowned in the water. It's why you submerge them and let the water go up. They will take the water as necessary. Otherwise, you're going to kill them. So what if you have a plant that's growing in soil that doesn't allow for the oxygen. You need to have the metaphors. Like mangroves, which is what that tree is. The ground is saturated with water because mangroves grow in wetlands. And oxygen is not overly abundant in water. Do you remember how like two weeks ago or three weeks ago we had the king tide that kicked in? Or we just had really, really high surf and it was like ripping apart all the rich people's homes in Malibu and in Ensenadas and in San Diego. And it's like, oh no, our poor house. Like That's like one of your three $50 million mansions. Oh, boo-hoo to you. Do you know the things that fight against king tides better than anything else we've ever known? Better than levees, anything like that? Mangroves. If we just let mangroves grow where they would grow, all that crap that happens to seaside areas, especially if they're wetland areas, none of it happens. They are the perfect buffer against the ocean being evil. And we say, no, we'd rather have a house there. Mm -hmm. Any of that stuff. They are very amazing plants. They also are better at sucking carbon out of the air and storing it underground than any other plant. So if we want to fight climate change, we need more of those plants. The problem is they don't grow everywhere. They only grow in a handful of places. And you can't artificially propagate them. They have to grow where they grow. You can't really force it. That sucks. We have things like buttress roots. So buttress roots are like super structural roots. So if you have really tall trees and you have to worry about them swaying, you can anchor them down using buttress roots. We could also have aerial roots. So aerial roots are ones that come from branches. And they could be trying to get moisture. They could be trying to get more nutrients. They could just be trying to hold on to stuff. They could be structural. There's all sorts of ways that aerial roots can do their thing. 
with all of these root types, they all are subject to root hairs. So, I have a root. I am root. On that root, there's going to be tiny hairs that stick out. Some of these you can see, most of them are microscopic and you can't see them. What are they doing? Increasing surface area. And if you increase surface area, you increase its function. And if the main job of roots is to absorb nutrients from the soil, by adding root hairs, we can exponentially increase the nutrient gathering ability of these roots from the soil. A handful of simple ideas can explain almost everything you need to know about biology. Everything else is just words. So am I going to ask you on exam number two, here's a picture of a plant. Tell me the type of root system this is. No. But hopefully it sticks in your brain that there's more than just roots underground. They can serve more than just that one simple job. So we can do the exact same talk when it comes to shoots. When we think of vertical shoots, what we'll see is we're going to have segments where we're going to get offshoots. We name these segments of the horizontal growth or the offshoot. This is called the node. Then we have a space between the nodes, and we call those internodes, the space between nodes. Internodes are reflective of growth. So as plants are growing, they will make those internodes. These are not a good predictor necessarily of how old the tree is or how old the book the plant is there are better predictors than this because you can make multiple internodes in a growing season what are some of these other weirdos that exist so modified stems could include a rhizome rhizome is a horizontal root that's underground such as that one there, which would be ginger. Don't doubt yourself. There's a famous relative to ginger. Horseradish. Horseradish has an even more famous relative called wasabi. If you could figure out how to grow wasabi artificially, you can make a lot of money. It's next to impossible to grow because it requires water that runs at the right speed, with the right temperature, with the right amount of sun, with the right type of rocks and the water needs to have the right pH and the right salinity for it to grow. Which is why if you get real wasabi it's so bloody expensive. Because it grows in like a handful of places in Japan. And that's it. We have tried for decades to replicate it. And no one can. So if you could figure it out, money-making opportunity for you. Just saying. If you go and get yourself some sushi and you get, oh yes, I'd like some wasabi, what are you having? Horseradish? Yes, with green dye added. We have this type, a reproductive 
Horseradish is really good in potatoes. Mashed potatoes with horseradish. <gasps> You've never tried that before? Oh, it's so good. That, like, I'm not a horseradish fan, but horseradish and mashed potatoes. <sighs> like horserad, or it's uh, mashed potatoes and garlic. <sighs> Bring it all. <laughs> all the garlic in mashed potatoes. Together, no. Like, horseradish and garlic, I, I, no, no, no. But, oh, anyway. Stolons are horizontal stems that are meant for asexual reproduction. Meaning, you have a plant. I am plant. It's going to send out these horizontal branches, these stolons. What they're then going to do is they're going to drop some roots. Once they drop roots, they're going to start to behave like plants, their own plant. What the original plant will then do is kill off the stolons. And congratulations, you went from one plant to six. It's a form of asexual reproduction. Since you're not doubting yourself, name the plant. Strawberries. Strawberries are famous for this. So they're not meant for asexual or sexual or asexual. It's just they grow underground because it's more stable. Growing underground is a safer bet than growing above ground. So it's a stability thing. So if you're particularly finicky about where you grow, rhizome is better. Then we could have the storage version, so tubers. Of course, made famous by potatoes with their amylose inside. What about the ancestors? Oh, Irish. Are potatoes native to Ireland? No, they were introduced. Which is odd because we associate potatoes with people with whom they do not naturally belong. Where are potatoes from? Hmm? They're American. <coughs> and they're poisonous. Potatoes and tomatoes are toxic. We just propagated them to be less so. So if you sit there and say, I don't like tomatoes, there's historical precedent. To say no, I don't think so. One more time? Correct. But you could also carve off that part and then boil the crap out of them. Especially because they're gross when they're not cooked. Leaves. Basic leaf anatomy. We're going to have a blade. That's the thing that you think of as the leaf. But you also have the attachment, which is the petiole. All leaves are those two parts, the blade and the petiole. Sometimes you can't see the petiole because it's basically continuous with the leaf itself. So when you think of grasses, monocots, that turns out to be the case. But with dicots, you can see that there's a difference between the two. Some leaves are what we call a simple leaf, meaning it's one blade, one petiole, but you can also have leaves that are called compound, where you have multiple blades per petiole. If you were to take a course in plant taxonomy, meaning how you identify plants, this differentiation is the first thing you have to do to figure out what type of plant is it. You usually start with 
the leaves. You don't go after flowers because what if the flowers aren't there yet? So you need something else that's consistent. You go after the leaves. When I was an undergrad, where I went to college, everyone had to take plant taxonomy. If you're a bio major, you had to take plant taxonomy. There's a book in California called the Jepson Manual. It's about this thick. And all it is is a taxonomic guide to identifying any flowering plant in California. Just the flowering plants. We ignore everything else. Just flowering plants. Again, book this big. I avoided this class for two reasons. One, I suck at memorizing. I'm a horrible, horrible memorizer. I have to make sense of things, and if I can't make sense of it, I can't memorize it. Second reason, the school had three taxonomists. They had three different chapters of that book. And have any of you ever taken a class with someone who wrote the textbook for the class? For the most part, the answer is no here. When you transfer and you, take, you sign up for a course and you find out that the professor also wrote the textbook, run away. Run away as fast as you can because that person's going to expect that you memorize everything. People didn't graduate being bio majors because of plant tax. They dropped out of being a bio major because of this one class. So I said, hell no. I read through the entire course catalog. I figured out what I had to do to get out of the rule that I had to take it. I figured out who I had to talk to. I figured out what would be acceptable alternatives because it, it's listed there, but they don't advertise it. I got out of taking that damn class. All that said, when you sign up for classes, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you flat out ignore which is the course catalog, and you're like, eh, whatever, I, with the course schedule. There's a lot of things in there that can save you a lot of headache if you read it. Like, you know how you have to take GEs? So you aim to make sure that you take science classes that fulfill those GEs. And you look for the GE classes that fulfill two or three of your GEs. Because Some people are like, wait, you can do that? Yes. You just need to find them. Anywho's. So I look at leaves, and I have the little bit of plant taxonomy I know. I get the heebie-jeebies. So let's move on. There are, of course, weirdo versions of leaves. Like we could have tendrils, which wrap around things. So think of things that vine. Those would be useful, although vining is not necessarily the same thing as a tendril. So vining could be the, the stem itself wraps around, but things that can form vines will probably also have tendrils. The most famous plant I think of when I think of tendrils are peas. Peas will form tendrils. Grapes will form tendrils. I don't know. You can have something that's protective. So we can have a spine, cactus, yay. You can have storage leaves, an onion. Onions are leaves. If you've never looked at them, they're leaves. You rip off the blades of them, and then what do you do with it? You chop them up. You throw them into something that's hot, and if you keep moving them around, they change color on you. We give that a word. We say it's caramelizing. What caramelizes? Sugar caramelizes. These are there to store amylose. Exactly. You can also have reproductive leaves. They can undergo a process called apomixis. This is called the process, the process called apomixis. Tendrils. Rappy, rappy, rappy. 
when they grab a hold, they actually have little modified portions that actually kind of grip onto the surface it's called haustra. We also know haustra exist in parasitic plants, like all the mistletoe that we saw on Saturday. Those also have haustra. They help grab onto their host. Ouchies. Nummy nummies. I had a poke bowl for lunch, so place near where I live in Weston. Then you have these little plantlets. These underwent apomixis. So what will happen is these will separate, fall off to the ground, they'll sprout roots, and they'll start growing. It's asexual reproduction. Just rather than using stolons, we're going to use the leaves themselves. We look at the tissues that make up plants. Well, tissue, the word tissue. It's a bunch of cells that do something in common. Got it. In plants, there are three tissues. Dermal tissue makes a skin. Ground tissue is a filler. Usually we associate it as being dead. It doesn't need to be dead, but we associate it with dead stuff. So it's the stuff on the inside. Then we're going to have vascular tissue, which comes as xylem and phloem. And of the two, xylem is dead and phloem is dead adjacent. It just can't be dead because of what it needs to do but it's as close to dead as you can get. Just to show you a little bit of ground tissue and how it can fluctuate in terms of what it looks like, not that we have to remember any of this. It's these three pictures. Ground tissue, the cells can come in three flavors. They're called parenchyma, clinchyma, sclerenchyma. We don't care about the names. What you want to notice is the line on the outside. Notice how thin it is compared to the size of the cell. That line on the outside is the cell wall. Tiny. These are alive. If I go down to the calinchyma, the cell wall gets bigger. But if you look, the cell itself is still bigger than the cell wall is. These are dead. Every single one of these is dead. Sclerenchyma, if I look at what we see here, that little gap right here that I'm filling in, that's the cell. The rest of it, this part right here in blue, that's the cell wall. The cell wall is massive compared to the cell itself. And these are dead. What are these going to be good for? Structure. Do we like these? Yes. We think of things that are softwoods. Softwoods will have lots of calinchyma. You think of hardwoods, they have lots of sclerenchyma. It's just a game of how thick the cell walls are. And obviously it takes a lot more to get to the sclerenchyma stage, so it tends to be a little nicer, tends to be a little bit more expensive. It's a lot harder to work with. Details. How do these things grow? Really quickly. We've dealt with internodes and all that fun stuff, so we've seen that. These are not trustworthy for figuring out how old a plant is. What is trustworthy are tree rings. We can use tree rings to figure out how old a plant is. That's easy enough. You count the number of tree rings, you know the age. It has 100 rings, 
100 years of growth. Got it. The thing is, if I look at a tree ring and I happen to have like something weird going on with this one spot here, I can use chemistry to figure out that there's something weird in that one ring. If I get a plant from a different location and I say, oh, I find the exact same weirdness, but it's in that ring there, and everywhere I keep finding this exact same anomaly, what I can do is use it, this anomaly in the tree ring, because of some chemical found in it, to match up these pieces of wood. These would be the same year. Which now means, if I have one reference point, I can now start to connect pieces of wood to other pieces of wood around the world. And if I were to say, oh, I know when this event was, I know this year, I can now backtrack and figure out what year this one is. Which means I can now use that to figure out how old this one is. I could use events that I know from one piece of wood to tell me about other pieces of wood. That science is called dendrochronology. Chronology, figuring out timeline, putting things in order. Dendro, branches. Can we use this? Yes. Three years ago, some of the oldest structures that we think were made by Vikings, we figured out when they were, or at least when at the earliest they could have been built. Because we analyzed the wood in the structures, and they had some events that we could trace back to Europe. And we knew the ages of pieces of wood in Europe so we automatically knew when those tree pieces to make the wood, when those were at the earliest would have been cut down. So we used analyzing tree rings to age stuff built by Vikings. And we know the youngest it could possibly be, which is better than using stuff like carbon dating it's much better than carbon dating. We can actually start tracking wood from around the world and we know what's going on with them. All of these grow because they have stuff called meristems. We've met meristems before because some of you went and you lobbed off the tops of them. And you've been growing or measuring the lengths of the little side buds that are growing, those little axillary growths. Inside of meristems, this is where the stem cells exist in plants. And all meristems are going to follow the same three steps. What they're going to do is they're going to divide. They then elongate. And then they differentiate. Meaning they're going to turn into dermal tissue, or vascular tissue, or ground tissue. They split apart. You've stared at this before without knowing it. Because at some point in your life, you have been asked to stare at this little Viking thing. Because you've been asked to look on a slide and look at what we call an allium root tip. They look like little bullets. And you're looking at them to look at the stages of mitosis. You've all looked at these things. I guarantee you, you have. What you're actually looking at is the end of an onion root. That's what you're staring at. You're staring at onion roots. What do you see? The end of it turns out to be something called the root cap. This is so it can shove its way through the soil. What you have right underneath it, these are the stem cells. 
So we get an area where we get division. We'll get an area where the cells get longer. And then we'll get an area where they start to change, which is to say they differentiate. And like I said, you've stared at these things so many times. So how do these things get fatter? They have a second meristem tissue. That second meristem tissue, and this is the last slide, is called the cambium layer. So this is growth tissue. Or growth layer. And the way they turn out to grow is when you have this layer in it, is they grow by pushing themselves outwards, meaning the cells in here are going to push this way. So they're going to grow outwards, but they're also going to push out the outside. So it's like... What I'm going to try and do is when I grow, I'm going to push this way. So I'm going to push like this. But while I push away, I'm also going to push outwards. So when I grow again, I'm going to push this way, but I'm also going to shove this way. When I grow again, I'm going to push this way, but I'm also going to push this way. So it's double pushing. This layer of growth, this double push, shows up. When it grows and then it stops, grows and then it stops. Well, what's that following? The seasons. The growth and stop is an annual event, which is why this pattern we can track by the year because it happens in one year bursts. Unlike those inner nodes, which can happen multiple times in a year. But this is the pattern that occurs as we go from winter to winter. Winter to winter. And that's what we use. Do you know the name of the plant from which we get cork? That's right, it's called a cork tree. Good job. The cork is just the outside, the outside layer. It's there to protect. You know what country gives us cork? That's right, Portugal. Something on the order of like 90% of the world's cork comes from Portugal. And it's operated by like four families. Because they're the ones who know how to harvest the cork. If we were to try and do it, we'd just destroy it all. What's the problem with all that? Outside of it's a kind of a monopoly, the trees are dying. Tuesday, we have a test. Thursday, we're going to talk math.